What is going on, guys? Welcome back. If we sound alike, we're destined to sound alike. I've got a new computer, a new microphone, and uh, just about changed everything but where I'm sitting. And why would I change where I'm sitting, Jimmy? This is where we've made this podcast the past year and couple months. And good Lord, it's been a heavy lifting kind of week. But the light is at the end of the tunnel, and we are just about ready to drive through. Have you ever it's crazy, experienced... Yeah. yeah, it's what I thought it would be. And then this show, you know, like I was prepared, I thought. Um, let me ask you this before we get into this, because I was going over these cards and my brain is just a wreck of fighters. Is it me or were these fights really all even? Man, I really thought that about this card. It was it was so hard to pick a lot of these fights and. I think it's going to be even really entertaining. There are no real setup fights for anybody. Um, there are a lot of question marks. I, the last few cards to me have been even, but this one is almost exceptionally so. Because I thought, I thought honestly, um, that Glover Teixeira was kind of a setup for Anthony Smith. Like you could see what they were trying to do. Uh, it didn't work out that way, but I don't get that feeling on any of these fights on Saturday. I don't get that feeling at all. I think there's good matchmaking here, but it really, I didn't know if I was just, you know, MMA overload or I was just thinking to myself like, man, like I've watched a lot of back tape, but you know, some of these are just interesting ones. We're going to start it off. Yudong Song, Song Yudong, however you want to say it. Marlon Vera, you know, Yudong came to the UFC with a ton of hype, really carried it over his first couple fights uh, coming off a battle with Cody Stamen. But I think that fight, more than anything, showed some gra uh, some gaps in his ground game. And while Vera isn't that traditional wrestler like you would see with Cody, uh, he does have a really solid ground game and pressure. Uh, to me, Vera struggles with starting fast, and that's something we've seen Yadong start really strong and show nice hand speed and striking. And it's it's hard to know when we talk about even fights. I think it's more whose strengths are going to play out here. So I'm going to go with Song Yadong early, but with the caveat, if Marlon Vera drags this fight out, he more than likely would win as this fight goes longer. Look, this is, to me, the toughest one to pick. It's really a coin flip fight. 15-5-1, and 15-4-1, Marlon Vera on a four-fight win streak. Uh, Yudong Song on a great win streak, of course, a draw against Cody Stamen, but th there's no, you know, shame in that one. Excellent fighter. So it's about the little tiny things. I think Marlon Vera down the stretch, as you said, is going to be a, little, a bit too busy for Song. And I think that's what's going to do it. Nice puncher. I like his combinations. I like his aggressiveness late. Um, and it's also a personal thing. Just having met Marlon Vera, he's a really nice guy. Lucky enough to interview him uh, in Argentina and that could be the, a little bit of the deciding factor for me. Maybe kind of a gut pick, but I'm going with Marlon Barry on this one. But as you said, such a close fight. I, but I, I think if Song doesn't get him out of there early, and I think I think Vera has the toughness to weather an early storm and make it about attrition late. That's why I'm picking him. I, I mean, if you're friends, you, you pick your friends, right? Yeah, no, we're not friends, but there's just something I'm like, you know, it, they're so even that I'm like, eh, and I like Vera. <laughs> so I guess that's what's pushing me over the top. But it's more about his his ability to pace fights and his ability to finish strong as opposed to start strong. I like his versatility. They they fought basically the same caliber of opponent, essentially. Um, and they've had similar performances against that level. I think the winner here becomes a dark horse contender at 35 if they have a dominant performance. Yeah, agreed. A lot, a lot on the line in terms of both guys taking a big step up. It's a big step, whoever wins. Whoever takes the step, it's a big one. Moving up, you've got Eric Anders and Christoph Yako. Kind of a clash of styles, you know, but really similar fighters in terms of where they've come from. You know, Anders kind of rebuilding nearly out of the UFC, in my opinion. They basically, you know, handed him some events, some showcases. He faltered. Now he comes in. After three, well, he had three losses. Yatko had a, lo a losing streak of his own and, and took some time off to come back and get on track. So really, these guys are in similar places. But to me, when I look at it, Anders is just a bigger fighter. And when I look at his fights, I think that size really translates into his confidence. If he feels like he can overpower somebody, 
it's almost like he fights different. Whereas, you know, you've got Yatko, who is going to be the counterfighter, be the kickboxer. But I just don't think he's going to be able to stay on the outside and win this fight. I also think, and I know we're going to get into this with the main event, there's a lot of emotions for Walt Harris. But Eric Anders, being Walt Harris's teammate, and knowing that Walt Harris is going to sit back and watch this fight, I think that's going to be just the emotional bump that Eric Anders needs to get through this. He wants to make a statement. He wants to make his team might proud. And he's got something to fight for in Walt Harris. And I think that is going to be one of the small things. It's a close fight, but I think small things like that can mean a lot. That's very true. Um, I think the issue is going to be Eric Anders has a decent takedown when he decides to go there. He's a great athlete, of course, college standout football player, uh, explosive, big for the weight class. And I think that physicality is going to be a bit too much for Yatko. It's not a matter of does Yatko have the technique to pick him apart from the outside. I think he does, but he doesn't, I don't think, have everything it takes to stay on his feet if Anders decides, hey, I'm going to bull rush change levels, get a takedown. Not the cleanest wrestler in the world. That's not his background. But he does have the explosiveness to pull it off. He has the athleticism to pull it off. Um, And I think that's going to be the issue. The physical ceiling for Anders is just a bit higher. We saw that early on in his career. I think that's why he got a push early and had a middle stretch that of losses that – I mean, the Santos loss, that was at 205. That was late notice. But, um, you know – Losing to Khalil Roundtree, uh, okay. I mean, that's, you know, those are the guys he's supposed to get over. Do you know what I'm saying? You lose to Machida, he's experienced. Okay. You lose to Tiago Santos, okay. He's a 205 or that's short notice. Elias Theodoro, Khalil Roundtree are the guys you got to get over to get out of the middle of the pack at 185 pounds. And he didn't do that. But I think this fight, he gets somewhat back on track, works the takedown. I think he he wins a decision in this one. Moving up, featherweight, Danny Gay, Edson Barbosa. This is going to be a great fight. I mean, Ige is on a tear of his own, a guy that welcomes damage, gets into really heated exchanges, but I'm not sure that he's going to want to do that with Barbosa. Barbosa is a guy that won't just hit you once. He's going to hit you with a combo. And I really think, weight classes aside, he's one of the best strikers in the world. He also has an incredible fight IQ. The adjustments he makes himself, not with corner work, but the adjustments he makes in fights is just unparalleled. Now, I think it's a crapshoot here at 145, but I'm going to go with Barbosa with the speed and maybe even the size advantage in this fight. Here's the tough one for me, is that Edson Barbosa, I think, is moving weight classes for the wrong reason. Not that he can't easily make 45. Apparently, he made it fa- He made it fairly easily. He's lost four out of his last five. Okay, now that stretch, Khabib, Kevin Lee, Dan Hooker, you won that one, Justin Gaethje, Paul Felder. These are some of the best in the world at 155 pounds. His other losses, Tony Ferguson, right? Donald Cerrone. Th- this is a guy who's, who's just faced a murderer's row of really great talent. Beat Pettis, Melendez, I mean... Felder, like it's craziness. The, the the murderer's row he had to go through, that takes something out of you. Now, obviously, he's going down to 145 because, you know, losing four out of the last five, he's not going to be a factor at 155. And you don't want to be a gatekeeper in a division that, that's that good. So he's kind of being negatively pulled down to 45 rather than positively going, okay, I've accomplished what I want to accomplish. I'm going to move and see if I can do something else. I think maybe the, the, the beatings kind of catch up to him in this fight because Dan Ige, uh, against Mursad Bektik, another great kickboxer. He put it on him. Stayed close, great combinations, kept it at boxing range. I think he wants to do that again against Barbosa. Barbosa, great kicks. That's really what he's, he's kind of known best for. Uh, I think Dan Ige can turn this into a boxing match, turn the pace up, and outwork Barbosa on the inside. I'm kind of taking the upset in this one. I'm going with Dan Ige. This is maybe the most we've ever disagreed I can think of in a long time. What, twice so far? Out of three fights. I mean, we're batting, you know. I know, it's crazy. Well, let's see what we get. Well, let's see what we get with these last two. All right. We'll see what happens. Uh, before before we get into those, I do just want to double back featherweight. There was uh, a weigh-in by, of all people, Uriah Faber. <laughs> yep. What was that? What was that noise, Jimmy? I just, you know, I... I, I 
I'm sure you know this already. We've discussed it. I don't like comebacks. I don't like comebacks. They're just not something I enjoy at all. And your eye favor is stepping on scale to fill in for somebody. I get it. Cool. Great. He's, he's, he's ready to fill in. I think it's for song because, uh, he, I guess he's having some kind of visa issues. Um, I get that. I just don't like seeing guys who are retired, who have plenty of money, who are ready to move on to the next phase in their lives coming back again. It's, I'm just not a fan of that in general, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, as a, why. as a huge Uriah Faber fan, a guy that literally helped build MMA where it is today. You just, it's, it's one of those times where I don't want the last memories to be the worst ones. And I definitely don't need him going out there and putting himself at risk for fights that literally mean nothing. Just him. That, that, that means zero. Exactly. That means zero for his legacy. Right? His legacy set. Okay. So he beats, let's say, you know, if he's in for a song, he beats Marlon Vera. Great. Okay. We saw what happened against Peter Yan. He can't compete with the elite at 35, 45. He, he can't do it. So. What are, you, what are you trying to prove? I, I just, I personally don't like it and I never have comebacks. I just, other, they're, they're not my thing. Other side of that, I, I mean, if, if he were to lose, what, what, what does it do for Marlon Vera? Nothing? Uh, you, you, you stepped up and beat a last second replacement? It, 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 it just, yeah. it does nothing for either one. You know, we talk about holding up the division. In a way, it, it kind of does hold up the division. Sure. The, the, the only way I, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, where, where I see it as acceptable is if, if Song wasn't going to fight anyway, meaning he has visa issues, so Uriah Faber had to step in. I get that in that Vera could beat Uriah Faber, he could not fight at all. You know what I mean? He isn't replaced, he isn't taking someone else's spot like he did against Peter Yan, for example, um, because Song can't make it. So I, I see that. I don't see it so much as, you know, holding up a division because Song wouldn't be able to make it, and so Vera wouldn't be able to fight. Um, so I don't see that angle. I just I don't see the point in a Uriah Faber coming back to MMA at all when he had so many opportunities to be number one. He could never be the guy. Couldn't beat Jose Aldo. Couldn't beat Dominic Cruz. Right. That was the issue. He couldn't beat the bet. We know how good Uriah Faber was in his prime. An excellent fighter right near the top, but never quite the man. OK. Once Jose Aldo came on the scene, that was it. Right, first it was Mike Brown, then it was it was Jose Aldo, and Uriah Faber was always relegated to to bridesmaid, and that's fine. I mean, it's, you know, that's you get as far as you get. Incredibly entertaining. The guy put asses in seats. Wonderful, but he had a lot of opportunities to show us everything he had, and you know, we, we know nothing else from here on out is going to change that. Nothing at all. It, it's funny because we just saw you know the the Henry Cejudo retirement. And when you think about someone's legacy, to me, the legacy of a guy like Uriah Faber is written in his fights, not not wins and losses, not championship belts. I would imagine you would be hard pressed right now to find a, a true MMA fan that would put someone like Henry Cejudo above someone like Uriah Faber in hey, which fighter did you care more about? Which fighter do you enjoy watching more? There's no question that Uriah couldn't win championships, okay? He faltered a lot, you know, but the problem is when he was the any he's one of those guys where if he had been the man at any other time, he would have been the man. But the problem is, as you said, they always had a Dominic Cruz. He always had somebody that was just that step above him. You know, and, and it hurts as you know to see that, but I think it's also there's a humanizing element to that. We can relate to that. There, there's always going to be someone that has more than you, richer than you, better than you, whatever. You know, there's always going to be that person. You just don't really see it play out in sport the way you do or the way you did. Well, I guess the way you do if he's still fighting with Uriah. It's it's an interesting, uh, you know, kind of appeal that fighting has, where you get to see a, kind of the haves versus the have-nots. And sometimes we don't always see the the Cinderella story play out the way you do in other sports, you know? Yeah, it's true. And, and you know, and a lot of people, I mean, I guess, because I, I don't know, I guess I have a good memory. I don't know what it is, but, like, people getting excited about Mike Tyson coming back. I'm like, dude, don't you remember the Kevin McBride fight? Don't you remember Danny Williams? Don't you remember the end? Don't you remember 
Lennox Lewis kicking his ass and it was sad. Don't don't you remember that? You know, and, and a lot of people don't. Maybe I'm old and I remember it and other people don't. But it's like the thing about the comeback is they're never as good as when they left. And they didn't leave under good circumstances. Right? Nine times out of ten. Even GSP when he came back against um, Bisbing, I, I didn't think he looked as good as he did in his run at 170. Sure, he won the fight. But I think he was starting to run out of gas personally. But it's like, you know. It's kind of like getting back with your ex. It's like you, you you broke up with them once. Clearly, there was a problem. So why are you going back there? And so that's but except you know you can get the piss beaten out of you. So there's there's a, a certainly a downside there. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, it, MMA a combat sports period is th- one of the few sports that that really embraces the comeback. You you don't see this happen in other sports. You don't see Peyton Manning coming back to the NFL. Like people are like, no, you're not good enough like you're gonna get hurt it's not you know i don't want you on my team um combat sports embraces that and and the problem is it works one out of every 10 times you get a cinderella man story right you get something that you know you you get a a a, a, you know a, a leonard Hagler where you're you're where it turns out well for the person coming back but the other nine times it's a fucking train wreck and, you know, but it happens just often enough that people forget about it. And, you know, I'm old enough that I've seen a lot of comebacks and I've seen very few of them work out. Very few of them go like, you know, GSP Bisping. Very few. Most of them look like Uriah Faber, Peter Yan. Yeah. And, and GSP obviously being the gold standard in various ways. And I think that's why things like that are, are so successful. But before we get yelled at, moving up. Claudia Gedalia, Angela Hill. We've done our podcast for a while. We haven't covered a lot of Angela Hill fights simply because she had kind of been on the prelim card, got a little bit of pull to the main. I am very happy to see her in a co-main spot. And you know what? She's put herself there, constantly putting fights together. It's nice to see her get this push. Very fundamentally solid fighter, great footwork, very composed, but by far biggest step up she's ever had despite all the improvements. And when I looked at her fights, part of me wondered if she didn't drain the tank a little bit too much, building that resume. You know, Claudia, say what you will, she's fought the best of the best. Cardio has been her issue. And to me, it's kind of a toss-up. You know, normally, if if all systems were regular right now, I would say I feel like Angela Hill can go in and beat Claudia Gadelia. But right now, given everything that's happened, given all these fights, I think it's going to be a a hard out. And I think, you know, one thing that kept coming back in my mind was the the Cowboy Cerrone versus Donald, right? Sometimes Donald shows up. And and why? Well, so many fights, you know, trying to do so much, never, never taking your body out of training. We just talked about it, you know, in the Gaethje fight. You know, how much of that was just constant training by Tony Ferguson? Well, how much is this constant fights on Angela Hill? I get it. It's the women's division. There's not as much damage. There's not as much KO power. But I, I still think at some point it's going to catch up to you. And I think this is where it catches up to her. Tough time for it to happen. But I, I think this is going to be Claudia Gadelia's fight. I think Gadelia has tactical advantages. Yeah, I, I, I do see Angela Hill maybe wearing down. She's fighting a lot. But... I, I see that momentum kind of helping her, you know, it, it's building her confidence up. She's on the best streak of her UFC career, three in a row, had some take, had to take some time off the promotion, came back. She's looked sharper. This is a person who her second MMA fight was in the UFC, right? So, I mean, she just didn't have the development time and she was fighting murderers very, very early in her career. I think this is a confidence builder uh, winning three in a row. That being said, I think Gadelli just has more ways to win. Seven submission wins. She has great jujitsu, great top pressure, and she can take and give a punch to get there. Meaning she has no problem throwing hands, getting in a brawl in order to set up her takedown and, and, and get her game going. Angela Hill, no submissions on her resume. Okay. She, you know, she, when she wins, she tends to win by knockout, and that's nice. Gadelli just has more ways to win. And I like the the fight IQ I see from her. I like the top pressure I see from her. I think she gets into a kickboxing battle briefly. And makes it enough about the ground game to win a decision. That's how I see this fight going. Well, we got back on track by picking Claudia. Hey. So 
I have a feeling I have a feeling I already know what's going to happen in the main event. So Walt Harris, Alistair Overeem. So look, a lot has been made about Walt Harris. We get that he's lived a personal nightmare. I can't imagine. I can't comprehend. I can't relate. Unspeakable. I understand that that is going to build mental toughness. Everyone in life has been through something. Trivial, large, tragic, and, and they all change you in some way. You, you change as a person mentally going through things. Uh, in the short term, I, I think this is just going to him, uh, just going to rather allow him to persevere through fights with, with the full intention of winning. If I went through this, I can go through anything a mortal can put towards me. Uh, if there's one fighter on the UFC roster that is susceptible to being willed through, it is Alistair Overeem. I used to stay up all hours of the morning, Jimmy. I used to watch Alistair Overeem, and he literally left a trail of bodies behind him, and he has a confidence that is second to none, but it hurts him as a fighter. Great kickboxing, great power, beautiful striking, incredible flow. I mean, go watch this guy's highlight package. But sometimes... Alistair Overeem gets in the way of himself. It, it started for me when he thought Stipe tapped, and clearly Stipe never tapped. And from then on out, it's just been, he gives fights back to the opponent. You know, and, and, and Walt Harris is just on the opposite track in so many ways. You know, sure, great power, great hooks. I think this is going to be a short fight, and I think it's going to be emotional post-fight, but... I just don't see any way Walt Harris doesn't win this fight, no matter what the intangibles are. It's it's just a fight that everything lines up for him to win. I hope so. Um, I, I, I can't think of anyone in the MMA community who isn't rooting for Walt Harris, but the thing about Overeem is he is perhaps the most talented and versatile heavyweight of all time. In terms of pure talent, of all the things he can do, world-class kickboxer, great submission game, decent wrestling. When you look at his toolkit, I mean, just fighters his size generally can't do all that stuff. But God, has he made bad decisions in fights. I mean, if you look at the guys who have beaten him, and when you look back at these fights, Antonio Silva, Bigfoot, beat him because he got arrogant. And, you know, got cocky and got knocked out. Travis Brown, same th Travis Brown had no business beating Alistair over it. Ben Rothwell, not great heavyweights, right? Goes on a streak, of course, and then loses to Stipe, but he has a tendency to give fights away. When you're like, with well, a Rosenstrike fight, he was ahead. Four seconds left, and he gets knocked out. You're like, oh, my God. He just, all that talent, but he, it's, it's just his tendency to, like, give fight, fights away at the exact wrong moment. I think as far as skill set goes, he can do way more than Walt Harris, but Walt Harris just needs to, you know, throw hard punches and, and stay in the pocket and he can beat him. And also 45 and 18, the guys just had a ton of fights, a ton. So it's one of those things where eventually they start wearing you down and the way he loses, he tends to lose by spectacular knockout. Okay. Doesn't just get knocked out, gets spectacularly knocked out. And that's just, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's who he is. I want to say it. You have, when you have 18 losses, 14 of them by knockout, that catches up with you. You're facing some very hard punches. You're facing guys who can, you know, punch through a brick wall and you're getting knocked out by these guys. So Ngannou made him look like a Pez dispenser. So to me, it's that combination of the number of losses catching up with him and the idea that nowadays against guys who are just hard punchers, he tends to make the wrong decision at the wrong time. And, and, and those two things, I think, come together at the wrong time against Walt Harris, a guy who right now I'm hoping uses his, his tragedy as fuel and had a great camp and is ready to go. I'm really hoping that. And if he is... I think Overeem's, you know, ripe to get knocked out again. Yeah, I, this could be a, a massive step in, in what has to be a healing that will never completely happen 
for Walt, a, a return to, you know, a little bit of normalcy for him. As far as Alistair, you know, as you said, it, it's one thing to get knocked out and have it a highlight. It's quite the other to have it be a highlight that we watch every time UFC comes on because it's on the free roll package. And more often than not, that's the type of knockout that he gets hit with. Ridiculousness, right? Like what the, the, you know, I was there for the Curtis Blades fight and it looked like a bomb went off between his eyes. When Blades came out of the elbows, like boom, there's blood everywhere. And I'm like, oh God. Well, that's what happens with <laughs> Alistair over him, you know, when he loses it's 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 always in spectacular fashion. It's always, always, always in spectacular fashion. The last time it wasn't in spectacular fashion, two thousand five. His first fight with Noguera. That was the last time he lost by decision. Unreal. Unreal. 15 years of knockouts. Craziness. One armbar in there. It was against Verdum. That was a... It wasn't an armbar. It was Kimura. But it's like... Dude, that's 15 years of every time you lose, you're getting knocked out. It's got to catch up with you. It's got to. And I think it's, it's, it's catching up with him now. It's one of those fighters where you watch and you're nervous because you know he's going to find a way to lose this fight. Like, even in the best times, yeah. I, I wait, and I'm like, you know what? I, I, is it, I hate to use the term, you know, choke, right? I, I don't think that he, he just doesn't show up, but he just really finds ways to... I, the only thing I can relate it to is, is he just gets overly confident in himself. Like, no, yeah. it's almost like no one's ever dialed him back. Like, listen... You you could be a world champion in the UFC, but you have to stay focused and hold a game plan. You know, you're not invincible. If the if what you just read off doesn't tell you that, I don't know what else is going to. But uh I I also think for the, the sport of, of MMA, I think this would be a really, really positive story that comes out of, you know, this whole big fight week and Obviously, we're we're just coming off a a very questioned main event with Anthony Smith and Glover Teixeira. I think this would be a really good cap to hey, from from two of the guys that apparently were the most against this Jimmy. You put on all these fights. Right now, you only have three fighters, at least that we know of. Uh, Jimmy, uh, one fighter in Jacare and two quarterman, three people testing positive. You overcome, you know, kind of a, a, a tough fight to watch. My fault that the uh, recap didn't end up on, on YouTube, but it is on the podcast if you want to go check it out. Don't worry. I uh, I broke my wrist patting myself on the back, getting the Drew Dober pick right, and I didn't get the email over to Jimmy in time, but that's okay. We we won't mention that, Oh, but I just did. However, I was dying to squeeze <laughs> it in there. I just didn't know when I could. But I think at, at the end of the day, th this is going to be the story that the UFC gets to lead with for a little while of, hey, you know, Walt Harris came back from something otherworldly that should uh, it should never happen, and is tragic and horrible. But look at look at how much him winning this fight brought his family back together, even if they probably can't be there for this right now, given the circumstances. But I feel like it's going to be a really good moment, and maybe one of the best moments we see all year. With that said, you guys know we will be back to. Uh, recap this fight i promise i won't screw it up this time and then obviously it's we're just another week away jimmy it's just constant fights that we have to deal with right hey man one more week and we're good but we'll keep them up and as long as you guys keep watching we'll keep making them all right we will be back in the week with more commentary